Welcome to another class, another message from Systematic Theology, Lectures in Systematic Theology by Thiessen. We're on page 238. And my students have been so thrilled by this study, they don't want to teach about anything else. They like this. They're learning. They're opening up, this study is opening up their minds to, to deeper things where they can understand the simple things of God and why God this, this, and that. We're studying about the law of God. The law of God. We talked about the fall in the last message, the uh, anatomy of the fall, and now we're studying about the law. The law. L A W. The law. Why did God give the law? Why did He give the law? Why? Because He gave us pollution. Well, <clears throat> let's just look and see what the writer says. Why did He give us the law? Why? To show how great God is and how holy He is and how unholy we are. And this is what Jesus was coming to grips with with these Pharisees because they thought they were better than anybody else in the world. They had invented laws. How many laws? 613. 613 laws they had invented besides what God gave. They couldn't even keep the ones that God gave, let alone their 613. They thought they were. But in amassing their pride, the pride is what that kept them from being and knowing really God. The law of God. The law is an expression of will enforced by power. It implies a lawgiver a subject and an expression of will and the power of enforcing that will. The laws of nature and the laws of mind and the laws of God. The laws of nature. I was uh, at my friend's house the other day and we kept dropping things. And I said, that's a gravity, that's a gravity, that's a gravity. And my height was like that when I was younger, and I think it was at least that much, and I, sh because of gravity, see, I'm shrinking, shrinking. My body is folding up like an accordion, the law of gravity. You throw something up, it's going to come down somewhere. I remember when I was very young, living in a little east of Bakersfield, <coughs> I heard a shot one evening. It was a high-powered rifle. I heard that shot. And then on the news that night, a man had shot a 30 odd six rifle in the air. When he came home from deer hunting, he just shot the gun off and shot the rifle in the air. And there was a worker up at Green Lawn Cemetery where my mother is buried up there. He was sitting out there eating his lunch or dinner and he just fell over dead. That bullet had come down because of the law of gravity. That man was killed like six miles away. That bullet came down, but it came down with such force, still, after six miles, that it killed him. He didn't know what happened. It hit him in the heart and killed him. Just killed him. <clears throat> the law of gravity. That's gravity and force. Now, anytime you shoot a gun, bullets come out of the gun. But there's also a recoil from the force of that bullet coming out of the rifle. And you know that in the army. We all know what the forces and laws of nature are. 
We know about uh, the laws of God. We have a conscience, don't we? And that conscience bear witness when we're doing something wrong. Their term law is so suggestive of a lawgiver or a giver of the law. When you're young and you're coming to the age of accountability, all of a sudden you have a conscience that's normally, that is telling you that something's wrong. You have a bad conscience. When you hear the Word of God preached, you have a bad conscience. Because you hear what right and wrong is. You hear the difference between right and wrong. The meaning of the law of God, the law of God in particular is the expression of his will, enforced by his power. It has two forms, elementary law and positive enactment. The elemental law is law inwrought into the elements and substances, the forces of rational and irrational creatures, so far as in wrought into the constitution of material universe. Now, people <clears throat> play down God's creation too much. People really play animals down. Do animals sometimes have a guilt conscience? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen an animal got, knew they were in trouble? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, of course. Are they irrational creatures? No. Let's don't play down what God created. They are rational creatures. They think. Just watch a crow sometimes, or a raven. Or watch a dog when he goes out and gets into something that he knows he's not supposed to be into. They have a guilty conscience, don't they? And they hide from you. Just like Adam did in the garden. So let's don't play down God's creatures. Now this man is doing that to a certain extent. We call it physical or natural law. Physical law is not necessary. Some, <clears throat> some other order is conceivable, nor is an end in itself. It exists for the sake of the moral order. Therefore, the physical order has only a relative consistency, and God sometimes supplements it by a miracle. So far it is in rot into the constitution of rational and free beings, we call it moral law. It implies a lawgiver, God. Subjects upon whom it terminates, a positive command, written in moral constitution of man, power to enforce the command, duty or obligation to obey, and sanctions for disobedience. This law is an expression of God's moral and nature and intimates that complete conformity to nature is the more normal condition of man. The law of God is not something arbitrary since it springs from his nature. That is not temporary. It is not temporary. Devised to meet a exigency an emergency, basically. That it is not merely negative, but also positive, demanding positive conformity to God that is not partially addressed to but one part of man's being, but to body and soul alike. That is not outward published, but that positive enactment is only the expression of this unwritten law of being. It is not limited to consciousness, but exists whether we recognize it or not. It is not confined to any locality or class of people, but it includes all moral creatures. The positive element of the law is that God's will w is published in ordinances. These consist of his 
definitely moral precepts as the Decalogue. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And Exodus 21 through 17. Now let's look at that for a moment. Exodus 21 through 17. Pages are stuck together. <clears throat> Exodus 20 and verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. Elohim knew. Isn't that right, Brother Roger? Yes. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and by the way, out of the house of idolatry. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven or, or above, or on earth or beneath it, in the water or under the earth. You shall not worship them, nor serve them, for I, your Lord God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing loving kindness to thousands and to those who love me and keep my commandments, my laws. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And right here is the verse that Israel heard. They knew the name of God and they said the name of God, but they would never speak his name again, and that's Jehovah as we say it today, but we don't know how it's supposed to sound. But they would never, they would say, Hathabar or Hashem, or now the modern Jews will say Adonai when they come to that name. They don't know how to say that name. <coughs> Adonai is definitely not a pronunciation of it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and in it you shall not do any work, you and your son or your daughter and your male or female servant or your cattle or your pilgrim who stays with you. For in six days the Lord God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. It is not Sunday. The Sabbath day is not Sunday. And the writer calls it the Lord's day and, and institutes it in such a way we will not. There's only one Sabbath and that is from Friday evening to Saturday evening. That is the Sabbath. That is the only Sabbath in the Bible. We know that <clears throat> the Catholic Church, when Constantine married the church of the state, he wanted to do away with the, with the Jewish Sabbath, so he said, We're gonna, the Sabbath is going to be on Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> the Sabbath is not on Sunday. The Sabbath is on Friday evening to Saturday. We even have Seventh-day Baptist. We have Seventh-day Adventist. Now, the Sabbath is Saturday. Simple as that. You know that the Catholic Church, <clears throat> after Constantine made that announcement and, and acted it into the law of this church and the state, people still knew the Sabbath was on Saturday. Later on, there was a great edict given down from heaven and God wrote a letter, according to the Catholic Church. And in Jerusalem, it laid on one of the altars over there in the sacred places, and it said, I hate you, I hate your children, I'm going to kill and destroy all of you if you don't start worshiping me and observing the sad Sunday as the Sabbath. Signed by God. That's a story, but it's what they said. And that's when the Catholic Church, from that time on, the Sabbath was Sunday. <coughs> Honor your father and your mother, that in your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not keep on murdering, you shall not keep on committing adultery, 
You shall not keep on stealing. You shall not keep on bearing false witness against your neighbor. You shall not keep on coveting your neighbor's house, and you shall not keep on coveting your neighbor's wife, and you shall not keep on covering, coveting your male servant or, or his female servant. And you shall not keep on coveting his ox. You shall not keep on coveting his donkey. And you shall not keep on coveting anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, I wrote that as it says in Hebrew, Brother Roger. That's what it says in Hebrew. It's the imperfect tense. And all the people preserved the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of thun a th trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then Moses said to the people, Speak to yourselves and we will listen, but let not, or they said to Moses, that is, the people said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. They were f afraid of God, and every time a Jew hears the thunder, they think it's the voice of God. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for the God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain in you, so that you may not sin. <clears throat> now, that's the law of God. It's not those 600 and something laws. That is the law of God right there. As we go down on page 239, it talks about uh, the ceremonial legislation or laws and the offerings in Leviticus 1 and chapters 1 through 7. The laws of the priesthood, Leviticus 8 through 10, and the laws of purity, Leviticus 11 through 15. They were temporal. And only God could say how long they were binding. These laws are supposed to do two things. Show you how holy God is and how unholy you are. The purpose of the law it was not given as a means whereby a man might be saved. The law never saved anyone. But if you broke the law in, uh, during the period un under the law, as we see right here, if you broke the law, what happened? You died. You broke the law, you died. It's supposed to show you. You broke the law, you died if you got caught. Th isn't that right? But it was supposed to show them how wicked we are and how holy God is. It's not given to make you worthy of coming into the presence of God. If there had been a law given which could make alive and truly righteousness would have been the law, Galatians 3.21. It could not make a lie because it was weak through the flesh. Romans 8 and 3. The scriptures that promise life for keeping the law in Leviticus 18 and 5, Nehemiah 9, 29, Ezekiel 18, 5 through 9, Matthew 9 and 19 and 17, Romans 7 and 10 and 10 and 5, and Galatians 3 and 12 speak ideally as if a man had no Adamic carnal nature. What are we going to do with this Adamic sin that we have, that we, that we water in? You understand this now? These laws were given as if you did not have an Adamic nature. But it was showing you that you are Adamic, that you are wicked. Man is hopelessly enslaved to self and to sin and cannot keep God's law. <clears throat> And neither life nor righteousness are possible by the law. It was given to intensify man's knowledge of sin. To reveal the holiness of God and to lead the sinner to God. Or to Christ. To the Savior. To the sacrifice. Man knows that he is a sinner by the testimony of his conscience. 
but by the published law of God, he has intensified knowledge of sin. Romans 3, 19 and 20 and 7 and 7. Sin now takes on the form of a transgression. Out here, Brother Roger, you came out and you saw speed limit signs all over the place. And it had other things. Don't talk on your cell phone. And all of these are laws, aren't they? Now, if you break those laws and you get caught, you get fined, don't you? If you drive 71 miles per hour, you're breaking the law. Now, up in Nevada, where I live, they won't give you a ticket for driving 75. But if you get it dark, dark 80 and 90 and 100, you're going to get a ticket. So the written law is 70 miles per hour, but the unwritten law is you're going to get by if you drive 75, as long as it is safe to drive 75. Now, that we see among mankind. And there's a fear there because you only get so much money a month and some of those tickets may be your whole month's wages or income. So that you have a fear, don't you? When you see the bubblegum machines going off, when you see a black and white car or even one of those incognito cars, it gives you a kind of a weird feeling. See, am I doing something wrong? The law of man and of God. Now, if you go down here to the nearest shop and rob, gas station or something down there, and you rob that place, you go in there with a gun, and you tell them you want money, you go in there with a long knife or some type of a weapon, and you tell them you want all our money. Sometimes they will fear that weapon, and they will give you the money. And then sometimes they'll think they're a better shot than you are, and they'll shoot you. That's what happened to my father down in Long Beach in March in 1949. He went into Robert's store, and the storekeeper shot him. He was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, but he was also breaking the laws of God and the laws of man. He didn't live. He died right there. He died right there. And was it right for that man to shoot him? He had a, he had, my dad had a gun in his hand. It supposedly didn't work, just for show, but the guy that he was robbing didn't know that. He pulled out a forty five and shot him. Boom, boom. He's gone. He died right there. Was a man, did he have the right to protect himself? Yeah. Sure. He had a right to protect himself. The law was given to, to intensify man's knowledge of sin, to reveal the holiness of God, and to lead the sinner to Christ. Man knows that he is a sinner from his conscience, number one, and from the written, written published law. As we go on, He said, we must show them that they are personally guilty when measured by God's law. That's the purpose of a preacher. Did you know that? The purpose of a preacher and a teacher is to show the constituents, the people out there, that they're guilty, that they are undone. But the law was also given to reveal the holiness of God in Romans 7 and 12. The nature and commandment shows what is right and what is wrong. The ceremonies and the rituals, the tabernacle with its court, the holy place and the holy of holies, the mediation of the priesthood were all intended to show the holiness of God and that only Jesus Christ, our tabernacle, our altar of forgiveness, our only offering for sin is our only hope. The ceremonial law sets forth the visibility, the holiness of God, and finally the law was given to lead men to Christ. Christ was the end of the law for righteousness, Romans 10. 
He's also the aim of the law. Paul calls the law a pedagogue to bring us to Christ in Galatians 3 and 24. In the Roman household from which this figure was borrowed, the pedagogue was usually a trusted slave to whom the moral supervision of the child was committed. As he trained and guided his little ward with a view to the future, so the law prepared those under it for the reception of Christ. Now I want to go to the Bible again. Go to Romans, the fourth chapter, and Galatians, the third chapter. If I can get my Bible to cooperate. Romans, the fourth chapter. Romans, the fourth chapter. And Galatians, the third chapter. <clears throat> Galatians, the third chapter, states, Paul writing to the churches of Galatia, you foolish Galatian who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now perfected in the flesh? Or by the flesh, either which way? Do you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law? How many of those uh, Pharisees were doing miracles in Jesus' time? How many of the scribes were doing miracles? How many of the Sadducees were doing miracles? They didn't even believe in them. Or by hearing with faith. Even so, Abraham believed God and was reasoned or reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith that are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, the dogs, by faith, back over there too. And remember the parables, all the parables of the Bible? Where the Syrophoenician woman called herself a dog? And Jesus called her a dog, and she said, even the little puppies eat at the master's table. He said, I haven't seen such faith among the children of Israel. The Gentiles, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. So then, those who are faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer, the believer. Abraham, look at Abraham's life. Was he a sinless man? After he was even justified by faith, was he sinless? No. Guy made lots of mistakes and did a lot of sinning. But he's called the father of the faithful and the father of those that believe. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide in all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is plainly seen. The righteous man shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith from the book of Habakkuk. Verse number 12. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. The law is not out of faith. He that practices these things shall live by them. Actually, this should be, they shall die by them. But one infraction was death. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, 
so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak to you in terms of human relations. Even though it is not only man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, signed, published, put into order, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. The seed was Christ, the seed of the woman, not the seed of man. What am I saying in this, the law, which has come 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise? Abraham was saved before the law, wasn't he? You look on this map here, God's map and plan of the ages. Abraham lived way, way, way back here. And Israel was, he went down in Egypt, didn't he? He took an Egyptian wife, had an Egyptian child, Ishmael, and then he took another wife, besides Sarah, and he had those other sons of Keturah, did he not? And now, ever since he took Hagar and took Keturah, those children have been trying to kill the children of the promise. Was that a mistake? Do you think that was a mistake? Way back over here, we have Egyptian bondage for 400 years. And then we have the law given. And then we come to the New Testament, and this is what they call the age of grace. I'm going to tell you something. It was always the age of grace. If anybody was ever saved, it was saved by grace, not by what they did. Neither was Abraham. <clears throat> For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on the promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. The Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are what we call what? Unconditional covenants. Unconditional on our part. Only on God's. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agents of a mediator until the seed, seed should come to whom the promise had been made. The law was supposed to lead them to the Messiah. He showed them they needed him. But when the Messiah came, they tried to prove to him that they didn't need him. And yet they did. Because not one of them that trusted in their own works was ever saved. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture has shut up all men under what? Sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody. We were in jailed under the law. Being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor, a pedagogue. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized because of Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. Therefore is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now let's go to another book. Go to the Romans. The church at Rome, whom this letter was written to. I want you to understand the law 
did not what one thing that show us that we need Christ, that we need mercy, that we need the grace. For in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned, accounted to him, put on his account, as righteousness. Now to the one who works his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as a debt. Mistos, wages. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justified the ungodly, that is, we are, now, people, raise your hand if you're ungodly. I know you won't, Marilyn. not going to do that. <laughs> raise your hand if you're ungodly. Amen. We are ungodly, aren't we? We act like we're not related to God. That's the way our hearts are. But believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is reckoned as righteousness. Just as David. Now we're talking about the Davidic promise. Just as David also speaks the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. This brings me almost to tears. That my God would save an ungodly buzzard like me. And not only save me, but allow me to preach his word and to communicate those promises and that grace to others. I am not worthy of that. I'm not worthy of pastoring the church that I pastor. I am not worthy of that. I am not worthy to do anything but shine your shoes. I am not worthy. Only by grace am I saved, that's all. Only by grace. Blessed, happy, happy days. Happy days are to those who lawless deeds have been forgiven. Happy days and worse on whose sins have been covered. Are you thinking about those sins that you've committed in your life? Have you thinking, are you thinking about those sins that we enumerated a while ago? Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not keep on committing adultery. Thou shalt not keep on stealing. Shall not keep on lying. Those are the things that was bringing us to hell without Christ. Happy is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Even though we're sinners, we're saved by grace. Is this blessing upon them, the uncircumcised, or upon the, upon the circumcised, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. What part of Abraham was righteous? The Spirit of God that dwelled in him. How then was it reckoned while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Circumcised means cutting around. They were circumcised. A men were taken out and circumcised. Their foreskin was cut off. The uh, uncircumcised were called the pointed ones. And God cut that flesh off. And that was a physical sign that you had believed already. Did Abraham believe before he was circumcised? Would a God count him as righteous before he was circumcised? Yeah. Not while he was circumcised, but while he was uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision. A seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had. That was a sign of the old covenant, wasn't it? What's the sign of the new covenant? Baptism. Baptism. 
were baptized because of Christ and unto Christ. He received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. He was a type of us ungodly buzzard Gentiles. Wasn't he not? He was a type of us. Because he believed before he was circumcised. That righteousness might be reckoned to him. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise of Abraham or to his descendants, that we would be heir of the world. And was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Heir of the world. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 3 and 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not one. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. All have sinned. All have sinned. All have gone astray. And all have fallen short, missed the mark of the glory of God. Two words are in there. Hamartia, for all have sinned, gone astray. And the other one is Estokio, for all have missed the mark. Hamartia does not mean to miss the mark. It's Estokio. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not the law. Not keeping the Sabbath. To keep the Sabbath today would be to throw before God the flagrant disobedience that you don't believe that Christ is our Sabbath. It's okay to rest one day a week. It's okay for animals and people both. But to observe the Sabbath is to flagrantly tell God that I don't need you. I don't need you. Christ is the end of the law and the end of the Sabbath. Sabbath is Friday evenings or Saturday evening. It's not Sunday. Romans 5 and 8, but God demonstrates his love toward us. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10.9 and 10 says, That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the heart you believe unto righteousness, and confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. For in grace you are having been saved through faith, and that not out of yourself. It is a gift of God, a lot of works, lest any man should boast. That's the law. The law was to lead us to Christ. It's not never saved anyone. The law is the ministration of death. Even the ministration of death to all of those sacrifices that represented Jesus Christ. It was administration of death to every scapegoat, every lamb, every bull, every red heifer that was ever offered. It was a sentence of death. Something innocent died for that which is guilty. We are the guilty. Christ is the innocent one. Our Father, we come to you and we send this word out, this message out that it might glorify you. I pray that I have done that. Father, thank you for all the blessings that you give us in life. Thank you for saving us ungodly buzzards. For saving these that knew not, not worthy of it. Father, help us to be servants of you. That we might honor and glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And ask you to forgive us. Amen. Do you have any questions? Who's the man?